thy shall call from, I can't read it, it was uh, prepared for the 50th anniversary of the Boston Psychopathic Hospital, which occurred in 1962. And I was asked, or I undertook to review research contributions of that hospital for the 50 years of its history. I shall simply uh, skip here and there with your permission because the hour is late and you have other discussants. But the period, uh, the per various periods in the history of psycho, I think, are easily divided into the Southern period, 1912 to 1920, the uh, Campbell period, 1920 to 1943, and then the uh, more recent period, 1943 since, where the hospital was led by uh, Solomon and Ewald. Now, uh, Boston Psycho came into being because uh, of the efforts of uh, people like L. Vernon Briggs, also the author of the Briggs Law. Uh, Briggs and some forward-looking citizens were upset that uh, in Boston, if a man were mad, so to speak, most likely he would go to jail or a place of detention without any medical care. Uh, or he might be whisked to the city hospital where after days of delay he might be seen by somebody. There were a number of deaths that occurred uh, because of unfortunate delays in treatment and because some of the patients who were psychotic uh, had um, uh, pulmonary disease which was unrecognized because they were examined too late. At any rate, the efforts of Briggs and others led to the setting up of the Boston Psychopathic Hospital, uh, which opened around 1912. It opened as an arm, as a receiving arm of the Boston State Hospital. And in 1920, after the death of Campbell, the two institutions were separated with independent management. Southard uh, was the uh, man selected to lead uh, Boston Psycho in 1912. Southard uh, was a man of uh, unparalleled brilliance. Uh, we learned from uh, history, a uh, gentleman who was not only a neuropathologist but also an etymologist, a philosopher, a literateur, and a chess champion. Uh, Southern, Southern introduced a great spirit of, spirit of interest and uh, investigation, and uh, uh, many, many uh, people came to work with him. Uh, although he was critical of uh, Freud, he nevertheless included in the ranks of those who work in the hospital, uh, people specializing in psychopathologist, psychopathology. And uh, the psychopathologists presumably made their contribution along with others interested in neurosyphilis, eugenics, dietetics, feeble-mindedness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the uh, Southern period is uh, uh, marked in part by the great work of uh, Southern and Solomon in the field of uh, neurosyphilis. Uh, I won't go into that, but I, I think it is not well known that also at this time, work was being done with alcoholics under the um, aegis of Dr. Warren Stearns, who later became a uh, dean at Tufts Medical School. Uh, Warren Stearns had a group of alcoholics, an alcoholic club, uh, which was probably the first in the nation, and uh, people who went to this club were said to have uh, run into less uh, uh, al alcoholic recidivism than those who were treated in the uh, usual manner. Uh, Southard uh, put a great emphasis on nursing and on the training of nursing. He also was one of the early workers uh, to be interested in social work, and he with Jarrett, as has been already mentioned, uh, introduced uh, social work into Boston Psycho and into Boston and established the first school for social work and psychiatry at Smith, one of the first schools. This was in 1918. Similar schools later followed in New York and Philadelphia. Uh, Southern, Southern was a prolific writer and uh, stimulated all his colleagues to uh, writing about their work. I think that is very important to note that Southard was probably one of the early uh, people to recognize uh, industrial psychiatry, or in fact to establish the field of occupational psychiatry. Some of his early writings include, are included under the title Mental Hygiene of Industry, 
trade unionism and temperament and the modern specialist in unrest. And this tried to define the place of uh, uh, work therapy in, in the world of uh, illness. Another uh, amazing uh, concept of Southard uh, was uh, uh, he believed in the establishment of halfway houses and uh, uh, wanted a convalescent home uh, under the supervision of patients where voluntary people could go. Uh, uh, Southard tried to interest the Permanent Charity Fund of Boston in 1917 to uh, set up a halfway house. This did not come to fruition, but later uh, was established some 35 years later uh, when Harry Solomon convinced this the group uh, to a, a group of women to set up Rutland, Rutland Connor House. Uh, the, uh, I think I ought to uh, skip rapidly because, as I say, time is short. Uh, some of the individuals who worked with Southard probably ought to be mentioned, not only Solomon, but uh, Stearns, Rader, Tome, and finally, of course, Carl Minninger got his start there. Now, the Campbell period, 1920 to 1943, has already been referred to as a period where little is done uh, in the field of psychotherapy. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, yeah, the Campbell period is characterized by a, a great deal of activity and an openness to many ideas, including uh, the uh, use of uh, funds to send young workers and thinkers abroad for uh, uh, psychoanalytic study and psychoanalysis. Uh, among the uh, folks who worked with Campbell in that period, uh, should be, we should mention Frederick Lyman Wells, who uh, was the, one of the first uh, clinical psychologists working in the mental health field and whose book, Mental Tests and Clinical Practice, was widely used after 1927. Carl Bowman uh, did a great deal of work uh, on uh, many areas, including alcoholism, and a listing of, uh, of some of the uh, researches that research work that was done by referring to the annual reports tells us, for example, that uh, uh, Kaufman recently returned from Vienna was studying the, uh, st studying the psychoanalyses of the psychoses. Uh, Clifford Scott was working on depression with reference to gastric function. Uh, Gaylord Kuhn, studies of dementia precox. Leon Saul, clinical physiological correlates in the psychosis. Dr. Castanian, blood sugar and schizophrenia. Uh, Michaels, relationship between calcium and potassium in the psychosis, rather far from where he eventually landed. Fleming, alcoholic patients as a group in the study of alcoholism and body fluids. I see uh, Mo here uh, recognizes all the names. Semride and Schwab in those early days, treatment of alcoholic delirium with dehydration. Uh, and Semride again on the audiometrics uh, or in hallucinating patients. Uh, Jack Dine, uh, progina and B in involution of melancholia, and so on. Uh, Campbell was the most inspiring teacher. I had the good fortune of working with Campbell for two years uh, the two years, the two final years of his, of his uh, leadership of this institution. He was brilliant. He was verbally exciting. He uh, had a command of the literature, and when he talked in our little sessions in the library, he would jump up and down, grabbing books from the stacks, and quickly opening opening them up to places that he could quote at uh, tremendous length. While he was very critical of Freud, he nevertheless knew Freud very well. I can remember in those days that some of us uh, would-be uh, psychiatrists uh, came to Campbell and said we wanted to know something about this new psychoanalysis. He said, okay, and invited in Ives Hendrick, who gave us a series of lectures, which was most helpful. Now, it is true that Campbell, in Campbell's era, uh, uh, activity seemed to 
kind of wind down towards the end in, in many ways. And I felt that with the coming of Dr. Harry Solomon, completely new vistas opened up, especially the concern with uh, uh, the dynamics of institutional change, the, the uh, social environment as a factor in the uh, illness and treatment of patients and a host of other things which are beyond the period of your special interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Greenblatt. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Havens uh, has uh, some words, and I see that Dr. Kaufman would also like to uh, speak about the paper. Uh, Dr. Leston Havens. I don't know whether it's fair for me to say anything while Dr. Kaufman is suffering with words to, to speak about this. No more. Exploding, <laughs> Exploding with words to say. Uh, I think Dr. Greenblatt has beautifully dealt with the uh, psychological impact of this paper on us. Uh, implied in his comments is perhaps uh, a recognition of why the author of it was not, w not here among us. Um, I'm sure he would have felt had he not been in Tasmania, but in Boston instead, like the, the well-known Bassett at the family reunion with these remarks. I, um, I think they've been, uh, been answered in part. We must all speak as sensitive native sons, of course. I think they've been answered in part uh, by Dr. Greenblatt's remarks, which we don't need to, I don't need to enlarge upon, although many people here uh, will want to add other details, I'm sure, either this morning or this afternoon. I think one thing should be said, though, in relationship to a, to a foreigner's comments about us. Uh, these, must, these, must <laughs> these must inevitably provoke some, some sensitivity. Uh, swimming as we do in this local sea, it may not always be clear what the, the mediums and the changes of temperature are from generation to generation. And when someone comes and puts his foot in our pond, as this paper can perhaps said to have done, uh, we can't but feel that, uh, that this is a criticism of perhaps even a personal nature. So with some uh, uh, br very brief effort to redress the balance a little in another direction, let me remark that the foundations of the work that we do in our field were laid in the first 10 or 20 years of this century, and that the great figures, the absence of which the author deplores, had disappeared not only from Boston and Massachusetts, but from the active, productive parts of their lives by 1910 and 1920. It, one of the extraordinary facts of the development of modern psychiatry that the greatest figures were largely contemporary, and that by 1920, Freud had done his most, made his most outstanding scientific contributions, certainly. The same was true of Kreplin. Meyer had passed into a largely administrative and community interest. Bloiler was still publishing to some extent, but the influence of his work was no longer innovative. And the same is true of the one or two other figures, including Janet, I think, uh, who, although he continued up into the 30s to make corrections and additions to his work, his basic impact had been, uh, uh, had been spent long before that. So that the kind of change that, that we are being deplored for participating in by this paper were ones not restricted to Boston but were essentially worldwide uh, in their impact. Thanks very much, Dr. Havens. Uh, now, Dr. M. Ralph Kaufman of New York uh, would like to. I think I'm the only one that was there in the 20s. <laughs> so that actually, I believe that this paper was written in Tasmania <laughs> in uh, a hut with no library, for one thing, because uh, I, uh, just didn't recognize the 1920s. I certainly didn't recognize what was said about uh, Campbell, C. McPhee Campbell. And this is not the reversal of the Oedipus complex. I felt that way when I was a fairly senior son as a resident. Uh, I came to New York in 1925 in psychiatry. Then I went to neurology at Montefiore. And uh, the question then arose for various reasons, where should I go next? And there were only two places <laughs> that I was told to get to, and I had an opportunity to go to either one. That is Adolf Meyer at Phipps 
but I seen McPhee Campbell in Boston, and so I went to see McPhee Campbell. Now, the only objection I've got to this paper is uh, it's a pseudo-historical paper gathered from I don't know where, what his authorities are, actually, and I think it's an insult and sheer nonsense for somebody to talk, not that he comes from it. I, I gather that the Pony Express doesn't reach Ohio. And if, uh, Mr. Chairman, you send him my message in full, if there are enough carrier pigeons that can make the, the trip to, uh, because it sounds like something from that era. McPhee Campbell happened to be one of the most brilliant teachers that I've ever encountered. He had a basic philosophy in relation to psychiatry and to life. He just happened to not be somebody who accepted things because somebody said they were so. He looked at them. And the happiest time of my particular professional life was when I was working at the Boston Psychopathic, which, by the way, they made a mistake, changed the Massachusetts Mental Health Center. But that's another story. The fact is that not only does this is the sort of picture, it gives a completely unrecognizable picture of an individual who was responsible, incidentally, for the best eclectic training that I know of anywhere. And by eclecticism, I don't mean taking bits and pieces and putting them together. Campbell took what was, to him and to us, the best in psychiatry as it was then known and as he projected it. And I think turned out a tremendous number. Now in relation specifically to analysis, I don't know how many know that Campbell wrote two very excellent psychoanalytic papers early in the 1900s, that he was responsible. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. He was responsible for a very large group of his students becoming psychoanalysts and dynamic psychiatrists. And the other thing that I think he placed a tremendous amount of emphasis on was the teaching and the opportunity of his fellows to do psychotherapy, actually. Quite to the contrary. Now, I think that uh, Burnham, whose previous thing I read, fortunately, only up to 1918, uh, is suffering from something. That is, the fantasy of the golden age. You see, everything was always better before now. Because by comparison, Harry Solomon, Meyerson, all these people that we talk about tomorrow, really, to me, were giants. Not because I happen to agree with them, because they were stimulating. The Boston was the center of psychiatry as far as many of us were concerned. And then to say, well, we did participate in this, that, the other thing. That's throwing a dog a bone. And uh, the consequence of that is something that I can't put in print. Uh, <clears throat> well, this uh, is in the spirit of controversy that I hope this meeting will maintain. Uh, Professor Hale would like to uh, uh, I'd like to uh, defend Professor Burnham, uh, whose work I admire immensely. Let me suggest that he's working from the written record. I've read, uh, just plowed through all of C. McPhee Campbell's papers in order, and I think they become thinner in the 1920s. I've also just uh, gone through most of the inpatient records at Mass General for the period. There is a marked decline in the use of psychotherapy at Mass General in this period under A.J. Ayer. It is really very clear and very remarkable. Uh, there are two other comments that I'd like to make. That is that perhaps the decline was less precipitous because the, the eminence was less real. That is to say, Boston, I would not, I would agree with you, uh, Boston psychiatry, there is no golden age up to 1918, uh, and then a precipitous decline. It was pretty solid all the way along. The third point that I would like to make is that in this period, there are the rise of other very important centers. Uh, in New York, at Phipps, and notably, I think, at Washington, St. Elizabeth's. Uh, I would go on to say that the vitality in American, uh, certainly in American psychoanalysis uh, analysis in this period, is not within the orthodox analytic group, but with people outside it, like Sullivan, who are working with White uh, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington. So what's happening is the rise of other important urban centers, uh, Phipps, St. Elizabeth's, at Cornell uh, and Bellevue in New York. 
And I think this gives the impression, uh, this gives, I think, this is kind of the basis uh, on which Professor Burnham uh, is suggesting that there is a relative decline. And I think that one can't but plow through Campbell's work in this period. He may have been an inspiring teacher, uh, but indeed uh, his papers are not of especially notable brilliance, I think, much after 1921. This is just uh, an offhand uh, historian's view. God knows I wasn't there. Uh, but I have been doing some reading in the period, and I, I would defend on the whole a good deal of Professor Burnham's emphasis. And also, if you look carefully at his paper, you will notice that he balances decline by achievement. Uh, he says that there is a decline in the notable figures produced at the same time that he suggests the team concept in Boston institutions laid a very solid foundation for later development. So the paper itself is not as unbalanced uh, as I would say the somewhat uh, uh, interesting reactions of uh, those who have worked in Boston might immediately suggest. <laughs> uh, I would just add that also Dr. Burnham's paper did end on a note that the sun was coming out from behind the clouds in the 1930s. So uh, uh, Dr. Sackow has a comment. As a uh, resident uh, psychologist uh, intern at Boston just during that middle period of the 20s, I might add a few words to what is said. And I'd like to defend uh, uh, Dr. Burnham's uh, point of view to some extent. Uh, I was very much excited by what I got at the psycho while I was there. But I must say that most of what I got was from Freddie Wells and not so much from McPhee Campbell, with whom I took a seminar at the time. I must remember, I uh, must also point out that uh, since I was living in the hospital at the time, I uh, used to attend some of the lectures that uh, uh, Campbell gave to the uh, uh, freshman students at the medical school. And I was impressed once as I was going out and following a group of uh, freshman students, and one was saying to the other, "My, uh, how wonderfully he he puts things. How what uh, uh, the the way in which he, he uses language is just uh, overwhelming." And the other one said, "Yes, that really is true." But what did he say? And uh, I'm afraid that for the younger people, at least, uh, the quality of his speech and the uh, of his performance in that way reacted against what older people and more experienced people probably got from uh, his program. But uh, all around, I didn't think that I'd gotten that impact, uh, the impact from uh, uh, Campbell that I had expected uh, would come. And I must say, too, that uh, it's too bad that uh, Dr. Burnham, uh, who's done uh, some really excellent work in the history of, of the field has not has limited himself to this decade because I think in the study of any institution, in the study of any field, you're going to find your ups and downs. And if you're at a very high level at one time, the comparison is with the immediately preceding level. It isn't, uh, uh, it doesn't say, and uh, as uh, Professor Hale has pointed out, he does point to some very positive things there, and he was seeing the dawn of another age. And, and I think if when he writes his history over a longer period of time, I don't think we'll be so incensed at how he evaluated the Boston situation. And I might point out one other thing that had been said to me by Alan Gregg in the 40s. I was considering at that time the offer of, of, of a, an appointment at Chicago, the University of Illinois. And I asked Alan Gregg about it. Should I or should I not leave Worcester and go on to uh, Illinois, Chicago? And he said, yes, he recommended that I would, that I do it, because he felt that Chicago now was going to become the center of work in the whole field of psychiatry, psychology, mental health, and all these other things. Now, my own judgment is that having been in Chicago for some 15 years uh, or so, a little bit less uh, after that, that Chicago did not achieve that level. And for me, 
all around over the years, Boston has remained the outstanding center in this field of ours. But I think we can accept certain criticisms of certain periods in this time without getting too overwhelmed by it. Uh -huh. uh, just one comment from uh, Dr. Wilfred Bloomberg. Uh, I'm sure there are many here who would like to, to say something, but if we continue too much longer, we'll have a group experiment in hypoglycemia. I um, begin to feel like somebody was at the Massachusetts General at the time that Dr. Hale talked about. Uh, I'm reminded a little bit of this, the cartoons by Glyas Williams in the New Yorker many years ago. You remember he uh, drew cartoons of uh, Grand Central Station by one who has never been there? And I suspect that uh, history from reading the literature maybe uh, suffers from that same content. I, I was at the General at the time when you said, Dr. Hale, that under Dr. Ayer uh, there was no psychotherapy. That's just not so. Uh, he wasn't interested in psychotherapy. Uh, but the only clinic at the general uh, that treated anybody with a, an emotional illness was the neurological clinic. And the uh, visiting people who were there were Dr. Colgate Kaner uh, and Dr. Harry Solomon uh, and others. Uh, and characteristically, since they had just started an appointment clinic uh, there in medicine and in surgery, uh, we saw in neurology uh, all the problems that were urgent because the appointment people knew that if you needed to deal with a whole person and his total problem psychiatrically and emotionally, it was the neurological clinic that you sent him to. I think I restricted my remarks quite specifically to the inpatient neurological service. The records of the outpatient service have been deliciously destroyed. Uh, uh, Dr. Greenblatt would like to I have, I have no remark to make anti or pro Burnham, but uh, just a couple of things that I thought ought to be said. I thought that Campbell was an absolutely brilliant teacher uh, with a tremendous mastery of the literature. And when he brought us on rounds and we discussed cases, we had to choose our words carefully or we would get sliced up. Therefore, he uh, taught uh, us uh, to be very critical and very careful, in, especially in descriptive analysis. Now, when he put these cases together, he, I thought he showed very great uh, ability in bringing psychodynamic and experiential factors into the picture. I think the paper that Mo Kaufman has referred to, uh, which, I, which, which uh, was a landmark paper, was on depression. It was around 1914, as I remember it. Now, there I'd like to change the pattern and say that in 1940 and 41 and 42, the psychopathic hospital was not a good place to be admitted to as a patient. And in this, I think Campbell was very remiss. He permitted patient to, uh, poor patient care, let me put it in a general sense, to go on. And while he might have been indignant at what he saw, he did very little to correct it. We're talking about 1920 and, and 19. In 1940, it had deteriorated. Uh, seclusion, uh, wet sheet packs, and all that were, were, were carried on to an absolutely absurd degree. And the, uh, uh, I say the, the, the basic care of the patient and concern for, the, for the, pa the details of the patient's life was terribly ne neglected. And the man who taught us that this was so was the man who succeeded him, Harry Solomon. Thank you. And I think we will have to stop at this point and try to reconvene at uh, 2.15 instead of 2 o'clock.